Hello, is anyone there? Good evening, everyone. Good evening to the viewers on to our YouTube channel. Good evening to the viewers from our Facebook Live page channel. Uh, my name is Yusuf and I'm your facilitator tonight. And I believe I've been in contact with most of you into getting towards this end. I just want to thank you for joining today's session. And uh, please do mute your microphones so that there is no interference, right? I request you to mute your microphones so that there is no interference. I'm going to give a couple of more minutes to allow other members to join us as we proceed to our today's session. It is an intro to assess a learning program as well as a continuation of the workshop that has been ongoing from morning, uh, also from Saturday workshop uh, for those who are completing the assessor training on the POE building. So uh, individuals who have just joined us tonight, please uh, bear with us. We will go through a round out to make sure that you are included into the entire learning process and also guide you uh, step by step on to completing the assessor course. First part, uh, please, if you have not yet downloaded the app from uh, our Google Play Store, please do so. You can also try to sign up onto our, our platform so that you can have access onto your smartphone, onto your gadgets now and then. Everybody who is doing our assessor learning program needs to be uploaded onto our portal for easy assessment practices. Remember, this is an online course and it is going to be marked online uh, using our platform that has been created to guide you and support you in terms of submitting every evidence that is required during the learning process. So please, uh, those of you who have just joined us and do not have our app, please go to your Play Store or to your App Store and download our app. Just go and search for Neo LMS, the way it is written, Neo LMS, and then download the app onto your computer or onto your smartphones. It is also been noted that most of our students that are already existing onto the platform do not have the app. Um, I've, I've noted that, please do so. Download the app and then we will be able to add you onto the system on our side. As long as you can download it onto your smartphones, we'll be able to guide you. Please do download the app. Please do download the app. To download the app, remember, to download the app, you need to go to your Google Play Store or to your uh, Play Store if you are using an Android or to your App Store or those who are using uh, the Apple phones or the iPhones, please, you can also go to your iPhone apps and then download the app, Neo LMS. Download our app, Neo LMS, and then we will be able to guide you. As soon as you finish to download that app, you just need to type in uh, Neo LMS, search it. As soon as you search it, it will bring up the app download it or install it onto your smartphones. And then the domain or the server name is BBT Institute and then sign up. We had some couple of issues as well <laughs> with um, students who are failing to sign up onto our portal. Uh, it is a simple process that I'm going to guide you now. 
um, most of us I see uh, have managed to sign up onto the the phone I mean onto the app however Mr. Eric you are not signed up onto our platform still you need to do so um, I just want to also understand uh, there's a student called Chopster Please, Chopster, identify yourself. I don't see your name uh, correctly. I, if I'm, I'm to check onto the system, we don't have Chopster. Chopster the Chop, please identify yourself. Uh, my name is Tusuitile Lobale. Your name is? Tusuitile. Please increase your volume. Uh, my name is Tusuitile. Tuso? Yes, Tusuitile. Did you uh, load your details onto the portal, sir? Yes, yes. Okay, it's written. My so is... Sorry? Or, or you can check uh, Denzel. Denzel, okay, Denzel, I see Denzel. That is perfect. See. Denzel is fine, we get you. But then we have Chopster here. You need to change when you log into the system so that we can be able to identify you, okay? Okay. Yeah, please, okay. you just need to change your name here onto your, I think your, your Gmail is, is, is saved as Chopster. So yes, yes, we need to my change stage that. Name. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I mean, that's my stage name. Ah, okay. Yes, is the man is the money making name. This one is chop. You are chopping money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, it's fine. I'll try to change it. Okay, Mister Chopster. All right. Uh, Mister Eric. Mr. Eric, you also not sub, you have not yet subscribed onto the portal. Please do so. Uh, okay, so I will work on that. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Yusuf, I will work on that. I nearly forgot about it, but I will work on that. Yes, please, you need to do so. Uh, so that you are not left out at the time of certification whatever is captured on the system is what we issue so if you have not uh, subscribed onto the portal you won't receive a certificate from us even if you've uploaded i mean submitted via email and all that all submissions are verified through the portal okay thank you sir yes sir Elizabeth, I just want to know, you're supposed to be in this class or into uh, the facilitator class? I'm supposed to be in this class. Okay. So, this, so you are welcome, George. Uh, we've been interacting today the whole day. I believe you failed to log uh, to subscribe onto the portal, but I saw later on you were subscribed. You subscribed later on and we saw the details coming in. Did you get access eventually? Yes, good evening, Mr. Yusuf. Uh, I just uh, uploaded uh, your, your app. Yeah, but then, like I was saying, that I just couldn't finish the whole process. You know, I could access some of the features that you requested me to, but I couldn't get the the information that you sent via the email. But then eventually I got it, and then I hope I am registered. Okay. No, it is perfect. We shall, uh, as time goes on, uh, you will get used to the the system and then you will be able to uh, upload any information that is required anyway we shall be able to assist you with that part okay okay thank you so much 
All right, uh, gentlemen and ladies, uh, welcome to assessment program. We're gonna do a quick recap on to the entire reasons why we are here, okay? Remember, we are running what is called a combination of three learning programs. However, we take them step by step, one at a time. So we are having what is called the, as, the assessment practices program. So the entire program is under what is called assessment practices. Why? Because this complies of all three uh, interventions that are required for you to be an assessor, a facilitator, and a moderator eventually. However, you cannot become a moderator before you are competent in assessment. At the same time, you cannot facilitate before you know the assessment practices. Remember, all these are integrated. Hence, we start with facilitation. I mean, we start with assessment. Once you are competent in, in assessment, you will be able to design facilitation instruments and tools. At the same time, you will be able to conduct assessment onto whatever you have designed. At the same time, you will be able to moderate uh, other assessment instruments that have been designed by other individuals. All right, so that's the correct. Remember, you cannot conduct assessment at the same time moderate on the same program or by yourself. So you cannot moderate yourself. If you choose to become an assessor, it means another individual will moderate your assessments. If you become the assessor, all right, let's say for a given unit standard or for a given program, it means you can as well facilitate it anyway because you are a subject matter expert. When we are doing the first session, we saw a lot of individuals they didn't understand uh, the difference between facilitation, assessment, and moderations. At the same time, they didn't understand which one comes first, which one comes last, right? The criteria is very clear. The CETA or the ETDP CETA is the custodian of the entire assessment program, which falls under a qualification called OD, or Occupationally Directed Education and Training Development Practices. So we are governed by the law that have been generated through the, the CETAs, as well as the QCTO and the SACWA. So this is the assessment practices policy that no one can become a moderator before they are found competent in assessment. That's why we start with assessment. Uh, Elizabeth, please can you mute yourself so that we can uh, have we can uh, be able to to have a clear a clear. Uh, Yes, I'm listening. Okay, I've managed to mute her from this side. Uh, we managed to mute her. Listen, uh, so what we need to do, we need to understand the differences between assessment, facilitation, and moderations. It's a combo learning program. In other words, you're going to do all three, right? However, you, you, you start with assessment, you become an assessor, then you submit assessments, you are found competent, then we do your do facilitation, you complete facilitation, you are found competent, then we can enroll you now into the final one, which is moderations, okay? It will become, it will be easy for you to complete moderation practices once you have completed facilitation and assessment. Sometimes people might not go into doing the facilitation part of it, because it's generic, it is an optional part, but we do add it because you might want to facilitate in future. You might not need to focus on two assessment. As BBT Institute, our focus is to, to explore all avenues in the assessment practice and how you can benefit maximally from the learning program without compromising your own standards in terms of delivering the right or the proper uh, practices that is required of you. So if you become a facilitator, you can as well be an assessor for the same intervention. If you are a moderator, you can be able to moderate a wider scope of interventions, right? 
So this is our role as uh, an institute to guide individuals in maximizing their potentials in their assessment practices. Remember, this video is recorded for learning purposes. If you want to, to view or to download this video, please visit our YouTube channel. Uh, you will be able to see all our videos are available. And once the class is complete, this uh, video will be loaded onto will be loaded onto uh, the portal for for learning purposes. So anybody can literally go onto our platform under news, and then you'll be able to download the video for the entire class. Okay. So with this, I request permission that I record uh, the session going forward. Uh, it is a request, why? Because we have a new law, which is the Poppy Act, which allows or which uh, does not allow us to just make records without making a request. So do we reckon that this session must should be recorded? From George, yes. Thank you so much. Yes, we can go ahead and record it. Yes, sir. Yes, it can be recorded. Yes, you can record. Okay, this video or this session is now in record session and uh, you will be able to see or to view uh, the video once uh, it has been loaded onto the portal. Please, uh, for any comments, you can just draw into the comment box and then we can be able to support you. There's also what is called the in-call message box. In call message box, you can type in any message that you want us to uh, explain you about and then we'll be able to give you that support. Okay. Uh, offline, if let's say the session is done and you need to get more information, do not hesitate to send in a WhatsApp message on 078-359-6290. I repeat, 078-359-6200. Uh, the same message or the same number is utilized by also our marketing team. But in most cases, we are sharing the resources that information once it comes, it is allocated to the right person for support. You can also send us an email directly to accounts at bbtinstitute.com or you can send to submissions at bbtinstitute.com however if it is a message regarding your, your student uh, payments and all that please direct it to info at bbtinstitute.com all right so please i'm gonna also uh, send in that information onto the in-call message uh, for your own record. In Ganda, sir, and let us see. The Gulago won a phone. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. All right, so I'm going to still also request, please keep your microphone muted during the session so that other students can be able to interact with us uh, without any interference. However, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, please use one of the icons uh, in, your, in your platform, which is for raising a hand all right, that we can be able to recognize you and then we'll be able to attend to you. Okay, so you can uh, send information via WhatsApp on 078-359-6200 or send to info at bbtinstitute.com or submissions at bbtinstitute.com. Those are our communication channels, all right? Those are our communication channels that you can be able to reach us and be guided on to how you can complete this learning program. This is a recap. I'm going to try to draw attention to even the existing students, right? Because 
when we are running through the session on Saturday, we saw that in most of uh, the, uh, the students that were in that class, indeed, they were far ahead. However, they didn't learn anything. Like, like it was like new information that was being presented to you uh, all over from scratch. So I picked up that uh, there's no point of moving forward when there is information that is being left behind. When it comes to assessment, it is very much critical that we understand the principles governing the assessment practices, right? We need to understand that the uni standard alone, it is derived from 115753, conduct outcomes best assessment. So if there is one of the specific outcomes that one did not understand, it will be very difficult for you to prepare, to conduct, to review, to give feedback, to organize, to gather evidence. It will be very difficult. Hence, that's why I want us to do a recap on all the assessment practices. I believe most of you who are onto this channel also are aspiring to become assessors. Some of you are already into the learning industry or the educational industry. Some of you are practicing already. You know, you are into the industry, you're practicing, but you might not be just registered, but you have that idea and the knowledge behind the assessment practices. Uh, my name is Yusuf Nsamba Samuel. I am a registered uh, constituent assessor for this very qualification under ETDP CETA, and I'm an assessor for this very unit standard and a facilitator as well. I'm registered across uh, a number of sectors, including services CETA, ETDP CETA, uh, local government CETA, FACET, WR CETA, the, the, the list goes on. Why? Because I've got a, a, a larger scope that I can be able to conduct facilitation at the same time conduct assessment. So in terms of demonstrating an understanding of outcome-based assessment, I can also extend your scope to a larger group, all right? I believe I'll be able to give you that support on how you can extend your scope to a larger group as well. So we have five specific outcomes in this uni standard. Remember, if it is conduct outcome based assessment, five unit specific outcomes that we need to understand, not just to cram and say, I've done assessor, but I want us to get an understanding of this outcome so that even if when you wake up and you have given a program, you are easily able to draw up an assessment plan for that. You can be able to draw up an assessment instrument for such a program without you going back to research and doing anything. That's, that's where I want us to be at the end of this learning program, not just to receive a certificate of competency or a statement of result or a completion certificate. But however, we, we must be able to demonstrate the abilities to design an, an assessment instrument, an ability to analyze an assessment task, an ability to give support to, uh, to the learning industry or to a facilitator at any given time. So that's why we wanna, we're going we're gonna to go. The first component, when we are conducting assessment on Saturday, we also saw, I believe, uh, how, how many people who are here on this system today were available on Saturday. All right, Mr. Elijah, okay, you were available, correct. Okay, those who were available on Saturday. Ah, okay, right. Those who were available on Saturday. Please remember we are on the part of designing uh, or completing the portfolio of evidence, but we went through to understand unit standards. And one of the key elements or the tasks that we are given that to design or to look up for a unit standard that you can be able to conduct assessment on. And I believe we couldn't look for those unit standards, if, if I'm not mistaken. It was not easy, it was a challenge to understand even what is a unit standard, you know? 
So we're gonna go back into time to understand the principles, all right? And then be able to understand a qualification, a program, a unit standard, the credit value and all that, so that we will be able now to prepare for assessment, conduct, give feedback and review on assessment. Okay, so tonight's session is going to be broad. Uh, uh, we are here up until nine o'clock, right? So we're gonna extend this time. It's, we're supposed to end at half past eight. It's a one hour session, but we're gonna have to extend it a little bit to also incorporate the new students that have just joined us tonight and then be able to have a broader uh, idea and uh, explanation on how assessment is going to be. Okay, before we dig into the entire uh, uh, workshop or entire program, remember these are the key components that one needs to know as an assessor, okay? One, you need to understand what is called the NQF. There's no way an assessor, you'll be able to conduct assessment without understanding the system where assessment is going to be used. The system uses uh, assessment practices. That is the NQF system. But you need to understand what is it that, uh, what is the NQF system and what does it entails, okay? So it's your role as an assessor to go make research one of the material that we are given into the portal that you need to download is called a learner guide. Please go and download that learner guide. Or you can read the notes online, of course, because the portal has got the entire notes also online. You can read the ebook onto our online platform, the entire uh, learner guide. You can, uh, you can download it and read it through, you know, offline. One of the things that you need to understand is the national qualification framework, right? The national qualification framework is one of the key, you know, system that you as an assessor needs to understand. There's no assessment that you're going to do without pointing or referencing onto the NQF. Why? Simply because every part of the entire assessment practices is drawn onto the NQF system. Okay? So, without understanding NQF, you won't be able to conduct a assessment. It's simple as that. The National Qualification Framework guides you onto the combination of designing assessment instruments, allocating assessment plans, uh, designing uh, of the awarding of scores or marks or, or competency, conducting judgment or allocating whatever you're going to do. It is derived from the NQF system because the qualification or the learning program you're going to assess is aligned to an NQF level. So if you do not know the NQF levels, you won't be able to know which target group are you going to be assessing, the caliber and the category and the type of people that you're going to be assessing, at which level are you going to pitch your assessment strategy, you know, things like that. They are all driven from the NQF system. So I ask you again, please, Go and read more about the NQF. When we finish up this session tonight, go and research more about the NQF so that it becomes part of you. Remember, this is acquisition of knowledge. You need to acquire knowledge by yourself. The more you understand these things, the more you'll be able to put them into practice. That's why our students who are here during day, uh, daytime or in the morning sessions, when an activity came through, they were unable to, to demonstrate which level can they pitch an assessment. Uh, how can they evaluate students onto a given learning program? Because it's part of assessor. Before a student is enrolled onto the course, it's your role as an assessor to determine the level at which the student is going to be assessed. Because at the end of the day, you will be able to 
know exactly which type of students are you enrolling into the course. An assessor doesn't come at the end of the learning program where people are supposed to be assessed and then you are asked to mark the portfolios or to conduct assessment. You are a part of the learning program from the beginning. So that's an assessor. And a lot of practitioners do, do make that mistake, think that an assessor comes at the last, at the end of the learning process. No, it's part of the development of the program, it's part of the facilitation, it's part of the, 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 the planning, it's part of all that. So we're going to see as we go down, deep down uh, into even the program design and development, all right? When we look at the NQF structure. Now, you as an assessor also need to understand SACA, that South African Qualification Authority is the custodian of all qualifications. So whatever you're going to assess must be a registered program. You are not allowed and as an assessor to assess a program that is not registered. Why? Because it means you won't be able to score candidates against the required credits that will be allocated onto the credit score onto the NLSD, the National Learners Record Database. So it's your role as well to read and understand the functions of SACWA, all right? SACWA is the is South African Qualification Authority mandated by the legislation to register all qualifications, to manage and institute all practices in terms of awarding credit value and the scores on two given uh, economic sectors, as well as accrediting authorizing bodies or quality assuring bodies. So it is a very big uh, organization tasked to manage education and training within the country. We shall also look at the National Skills Development Act, all right? This one is for you to expand your knowledge onto SDF, okay? So you can as well become what is called a skills development facilitator. In our program, we incorporate it simply because we want you to dig, dig deeper into assessment. Assessment doesn't only stop on two assessment in class. It goes beyond assessment in class and then we go to workplace assessment. So under workplace assessment, definitely there's what we call skills development, where you find a company is struggling to perform better or a company is not producing what is supposed to produce. The productivity of that company is being compromised because there's no enough skilled labor force. The workers are not skilled enough to lift up the company, to move the company business vision and, 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 and uh, plans forward. So what do we do as assessors? We go in as workplace assessors to support the company by pointing out the skills gap or skill shortages, then design a program or propose a program that can be uh, used to mitigate any skills deficiency within the labor force of that company. Simple as that. You conduct an assessment on individuals, profile them and see what skills do they lack in terms of completing given tasks that can promote the business or the company or the organization forward. In terms of also adding value onto the company. So that's why we learn about the SDF or the Skill Development Act. So the Skill Development Act is designed for you also as, as, as assessors to support uh, individuals in the workplace. Hence, you also become what is called a workplace assessor. I think I make myself clear. Please, if I'm too fast or if I'm, uh, I'm talking things that, uh, that you need some clarity, send in that inbox, uh, that in-call message, or please raise your hand and then you can be able to get a clarity. All right, so as we move forward, we're going to also to demonstrate an understanding of the assessment principles and methods. Okay, uh, Mr. Yeah, Tuso, please go ahead, ask your question.
no, you can I mistakenly uh, raised my hands my hand there uh but i was i was i was replying to that first question of uh should you record oh okay no uh, the record is in session and this program is recorded yes 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 i was answering that one that's why i raised my hand there so uh let me let me see okay yeah yeah, yeah. i'm good now okay all right so we move forward we shall also be able to demonstrate an understanding of all assessment principles and methods in other words how do we conduct assessment in which manner must we conduct ourselves as assessor when you become an assessor it's not a ticket to abuse the system it's not a ticket to insult training providers not a ticket to under mark students or fail them because you are the authority remember an assessor like i said uh on saturday an assessor is an authority an assessor has got the authority or the power to pass a judgment okay you are able to pass a judgment a student is competent or not yet competent however we have principles and guidelines that we must follow that help us to move uh, the practices forward in a fair uh, practices, in a fair way, whereby we do not discriminate, we do not uh, use biasing, you know, tactics on two students, we do not use uh, specific tools that are not being explained properly to the students or to whoever we are conduct assessment. So we've got a whole list of those principles, just like a teacher or a doctor or a health practitioner that they have those norms, you know, we, sometimes you can call them the SOPs, the standard operating procedures. Also, we as assessors have got our own SOPs that uh, an assessor must assess in this, in this way, in this manner. You cannot conduct assessment without following the principles of assessment. The principle goes with the methodology. You cannot conduct assessment on someone who has not learned the program. Okay? So that is very much obvious. So the methods of conducting assessment also will be looked at how do you conduct assessment. Then we shall go into how do you implement the good assessment practices, the policy on assessment, because remember, it's your role as an assessor. When you take up, this is a professional development course, remember, like I said, it's a professional course. When you take it up and you are in it, you become a practitioner. As a practitioner, you are able to give support and guidance to individual organization, training providers, companies, uh, HRD departments, you are able to support them at all ways, all right? Supporting includes designing and developing, developing assessment instruments or designing and developing assessment policies, the policy that an institution can benchmark on or support uh, itself moving forward in a good or a better direction. The policies designed by you, you are the one as an assessor who's supposed to design after conducting an assessment or an analysis on an institution. Then you can develop policies and procedures that they can use to follow. Okay. Feedback after assessment. We shall also learn how do you give feedback? You have conducted an assessment on someone. How do you give feedback? When do you give feedback? How do you manage feedback? We have seen this as a catastrophic you know, aspect where individuals are given feedback and then they commit suicide, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, if, you, if you don't know that also the matriculants have been assessed, when Umalusi releases results, before you remember, they were used to advertise in the newspapers. And then people otherwise are rejoicing others are crying and then when they see the results they just cross the road without thinking and they knock down some go hang themselves because they failed and their names have been published everywhere you know it's, they have been publicized everywhere so that part is also part of the assessment system feedback on assessment 
So please remember, we did this part, all right, before, and I'm going to emphasize it. There's no way you can conduct or design an assessment. There's no way you can design an assessment without knowing how you're going to report back on that assessment. There's no way you can design an assessment without knowing the processes, the technical know-how. How are you going to manage it? The methods that you're going to use. So this must be all put into context when we are learning about assessment. Then the most uh, interesting part is that part of feedback right feedback or evidence of competence this one is where we are able to produce evidence required for you to judge someone against competence against competence or not yet competent if they have achieved or they have not achieved all right they have failed or they have passed in nowadays language in the nqf system we don't say pass or fail right so much openly but we just rather say competent or not yet competent why simply because uh, we are given chances to improve when you are you, when you have failed a module you can rewrite that module and you, you you might pass it again you know so we cannot say you have failed completely but there is room for that uh, evidence to to improve on terms of uh, supplying or, or giving the right evidence. So the part of evidence is where we shall compile the POE. Uh, individuals who attended our Saturday class, that's where we are discussing about the POE building. And I saw literally, uh, uh, we took you faster into building the POE, but left out some of the key elements and components of understanding the evidence. So people were asking, so then what? what next uh, how am i going to do this uh, am i signing just to sign so it's like they forgot all the information about evidence and how assessment should be done so it was only focusing now on to completing and signing up uh, the, the the paperwork we, we we are not interested much more on to signing the paperwork what is in, in, interesting here that evidence must be produced if you do not gather enough evidence from the student to pass them competency, then it means there's no assessment that must take place. If you do not have proper assessment instruments, it means you cannot gather enough or there's no evidence that will be produced. If there's no enough assessment instruments, the tools that one can use to gather evidence, still there won't be any evidence. I think that that is very much clear. So I always emphasize on two individuals. Please demonstrate the understanding of what is assessment. Because if you understand assessment, the rest becomes easy. If you understand the principles of assessment, the rest becomes easy. If you understand the tools of assessment, the rest becomes easy. If you understand the methods of assessment, to compile evidence is the simplest part because it's just collection of evidence to support whatever you've assessed. It's, it's gathering evidence. If we are in court of law and we say this one stole a car, right? We're gonna benchmark on one, the information. Uh, the accuser is saying uh, one, the respondent stole a car. So the complainant must lodge as information how the car was stolen, what type of car, when was it stolen, how, where, when, all those must be produced. Now, if it is certified that indeed evidence is available to back up the claim, then a judgment can be passed. And that's when the judge will pass on a judgment based on the evidence. And if the evidence is contested, then that evidence can also be false evidence. Also in assessment, we have individuals that will produce false evidence that is not profound, that is not aligned to the guidelines or the principles of gathering evidence. And then we can also throw that evidence out. We can say 
please everybody must bring in id copies certified and then you submit an id copy which is not certified then that evidence is produced yes but it's not meeting the requirement why because it's produced as certified so we make a tick such uh, is uh, evidence has been uploaded as evidence but in terms of meeting the criteria must be certified within three months so if your evidence is not certified does not meet the criteria you fail to produce a certified id copy that evidence is thrown out as not correct evidence we say evidence supplied or uh, uploaded is not sufficient enough you get what i'm saying so that's an assess that is assessment assessment is 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 done on evidence we can only assess individual based on the evidence that you see you go to a classroom and you see students and you've taught a facilitator has taught these students about a particular topic and they all know that the topic was facilitated so there's evidence of facilitation but for us to prove that indeed these learners attended the classes we need to see evidence of attendance so someone can say we all attended yes but how did you attend when did you attend where did you attend that's all you can see it's only one part but we have manipulated we have expanded it further down to say when did you attend how did you attend and where did you attend it? at what time did you call did you attend this class so all that must be recorded so if a facilitator is unable to show us his facilitation plan as well as the attendance registers and the records of learners then it means learners never attended classes so the recommendation will be learners never attended classes so no evidence of attendance even if they can say oh learners attended classes there's no evidence you report on what you see okay though we also have compassion reasoning whereby we can be compassionate enough to determine at the extent like if let's say evidence is not sufficient but it is an historical evidence maybe it was done long time ago when systems were not in place then we can be we can apply some compassion you know and then be able to award a assessment based on to what is available but if it is historical and also there's no much evidence then still we cannot prove that such uh assessment took place so this part of evidence we shall look at it when we are compiling portfolio uh we were helping individuals on saturday and we saw it was really a challenge because they never understood the principles of assessment so we decided we're gonna take you through to understand all this all together all right and then we'll be able to continue and compile that uh, portfolio of evidence now with uh, with knowledge on assessment recognition of prior learning one is well knowledge you know he's got experience and got knowledge about a specific aspect a specific task or an activity or a job but they have no qualification to prove it okay that's what we call recognition of prior learning it means someone has been in the industry for 20 years as a facilitator but they do not have any facilitation course that they have attended or certificate to prove that they have attended such a course but remember that they have an experience in facilitation do they need to go back and relearn everything from scratch no in the new nqf system we say we recognize individuals past experience so what we do we take them through what is called the recognition of prior learning rpl i don't know whether you've been you know we, you know about this task but i for sure i know that in every industry in every part there is recognition of prior learning there's rpl where people do not have the qualifications but they have massive experience massive experience you know in the industry so those kind of uh assessments can be supported you can also do an assessment on such circumstances and award individual credit 
on how they can move forward without going back to class. We call it the credit transfer, okay? The application is available for individuals who do not need to go back to class and learn. They can just go through the process of the credit uh, transfer application and then apply for RPL and people can be awarded the certificates based on the evidence they produce as their past experience. Then the portfolio preparation is two-sided. We shall learn about this, where we support you on how you gather evidence, the historical evidence, current evidence, and the direct evidence on how you can gather such evidence for your own portfolio, and how will you use that very portfolio to conduct facilitation and conduct moderation. Because remember, we, we are doing a combo whereby we have three programs in one. This very program will lead you to all the rest. So the portfolio you're going to build will be utilized in the three programs. First, assessment. Secondly, it will be utilized in facilitation. Thirdly, it will be utilized in moderation. You're not going to build any other portfolio uh to conduct moderation on you shall use the portfolio in assessment to conduct moderation on okay so the principles will be the same but in moderation we shall be verifying evidence okay so please mark your team members going forward go get the names of your people like who are here please write them down if you are keen enough you can create friends network and then be able to communicate to one another on the portal. Our portal is so diverse and it's got all the tools that needs you to interact with one another. There's a chat room that also is available uh, onto our portal. Please go and visit that chat room. And also there's a section for the forum. You can create a forum and create a discussion on how you guys, you can be able to discuss specific aspects and start to engage one another. You know, you need to network when we come to such workshops like this one, not only to learn from one person who is a speaker, but also from the rest of the team that are part of the entire learning program. To pass on our knowledge and skills, one can learn from the other. The same applies to me. I, I'm not the person with the highest knowledge. I'm also part of the learning. That's why I'm a facilitator. It means I'm part of the class. Some of you might be professors, you have doctorates and all that, and you have good you know, advice or information that you've got for other members or for ourselves, then we can share that resource. Please go and subscribe onto our portal. Go to our YouTube channel, become a member, subscribe, and let us follow and support one another. Let this system be supported. Okay. I'm going to pause for five minutes, guys, or for a water break, two minutes, and then we can proceed and continue the floor is open if you need to ask any question please type that question and then we can be able to answer as we come back from the water break Yeah, Mr. George, please ask your question. Thank you.
Did you get the question, sir? Hello? Uh, we haven't got your question. Please type your question here in the in-call message. Okay. Do you mind if I pass the message? Yes, okay. What I'm, what I'm saying is that, okay, I'm from the aviation industry. I'm an ATC or an air traffic control. I've been in the industry since 2000. And obviously, I do have all the certificate in actual fact is from 1998, but then as a net traffic controller from 2000. So when it comes to an RPL, what would you need from me to prove? Because I'm not sure if you've ever uh, dealt with the people from aviation and uh, yeah. And how does it work in that case? Thank you so much, George. Uh, just want to ask, as a air traffic controller, are you facilitating or what are you doing? What are your 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 activities in the in the industry? Are well, you dealing I'm with a... people? Because I know air traffic control, you you more at the airport, but in the field of learning and development, are you teaching or are you demonstrating some stuff to other new staff members or what? What do you, do you do? Okay, I'm a I'm a kid C instructor because uh, okay, I'm not I'm not uh, in a academic whatsoever uh, institute, but then I'm giving what to refer to it as an on job or training instruction. Hence, I say that I'm a kid C instructor. And so, for me to become a kid B instructor, they require uh, the system requires me to have the uh, they focus more on facilitation. I'm not sure why is that, because like you explained, it should start with moderation and facilitation. But then for me to qualify to become a KB instructor, I need to have uh, the facilitation and I need to be a senior controller for more than two years, of which I'm more than like 10 years as a senior controller. Okay. So you have been doing some on-job training, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. For more than 10 years. Yes, sir. Okay. Then if you have been doing facilitation for more on job training, on job coaching is the same as facilitation, but we don't know uh, your key performance areas. What were you facilitating on and what methodologies were you using? Were you demonstrating anything to do with the uh, the new recruits and all that, cabin crews and all that? Yes, of course, the traffic controllers, because, you know, uh, you train them from the onset, and obviously it's all about illustration, because, I mean, a traffic controlling itself is a, it's a skill job. So yes. you, can't just, you can't just be giving a class without, like, you know, giving the illustrations or the demonstrations. Okay. So what we can do, we can RPLU on facilitation, you see, with this on-job trainer. But then uh, if it happens, uh, will you still allow me to attend, to listen onto the classes and then maybe, yeah, yeah to yeah, listen yeah. to the yeah, the class okay. continues. You paid for the class. You have to attend the class if you want to. But in terms of certification, we say the process of RPL can accommodate. So the specific evidence and application that you need to complete and provide the certificates for all what you've been doing and also the CV that yeah, and also a testimonial, a reference from your employer to confirm what you've been doing against your key performance areas on your CV. And that's all you need. And then OK, uh, I'll, I'll speak to you, Mr. Yusuf, on, uh, yeah, maybe on uh, email or whatsoever. And then I'll, 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 I'll complete the form and send everything. Then. OK, perfect. So what happens is that uh, I'll send you an application, right, on email for that part, but you still continue the class and then get to understand. Because remember, in the air traffic controller, we are going to place you into also assessment. Remember, now you are into the assessment practices class. When, yes, you, com yes, when you complete this training program as an assessor, it's an advantage because it gives you credits 
in theta. So you, you, the points that you accumulate in theta, you know, are more because your other air traffic controller, the the sector which governs the training and development, there, there are two sectors. There are two. You are under yes, the civil aviation authority at the same time sir. under TITA. Yes, sir. Am I correct? So under yeah, civil aviation yeah. authority, you get score points. Yeah, you get your points. At the same time, under TITA, you get points, you get credits. And then with the credits, you can be a registered constituent facilitator at the same time a registered constituent assessor. Now, this is a high rank when you become a constituent assessor. Oh, thank you. I didn't know that. Yeah, if it's a high rank, if you become a constituent uh, assessor, let's say in theta, you find that you're going to conduct assessment on a quite a number of programs within this within the aviation industry. You know, as an instructor, so you have a, okay. a larger scope, literally, to work with when you become registered. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other question? No questions. Okay, let's proceed. Now I'm gonna try to draw through directly quickly here into one uh, review on two moderation practices, okay? With this, uh, it's going to, I mean, uh, NQF assessment practices, with this NQF system is going to give you a full understanding of assessment in details. At the same time, it gives you an understanding uh, of uh, the economic sector where you fall under. George has just demonstrated one part. He say he's an air traffic controller and also working as an instructor, right? So it means, we search where does Mr. George fall under in terms of practicing, right? Every assessor must be having a primary sector or a, 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 an economic sector where you are performing or where you are working, where you have the expertise. That's why we call you a subject matter expert. Now, this gentleman is a subject matter expert in air traffic, you know? So he can do all those aspects. We have a lot of key performance areas or operations under air traffic management. So it means when we look up onto the sectors where he falls under, we identify that he falls under quite a number of them, but the main key sector where he falls under is transport. Under transport, that's why his primary sector will be transport, education and training authority, TITA in short. So the same applies to you. And now let us try to get into an understanding here. The same applies to each and every one of us here. You have an economic sector. Your qualifications automatically gives you the field where you best perform, all right? Uh, you might be uh, an engineer, maybe in water, then we know, okay, you are qualified in water management and then we put you under EWC, energy and water. You might be a plumber, we put you into uh, construction. You might be a bricklayer, you might be any profession where you fall, definitely it leads you to be in a specific economic sector. Hence, each, and one, each one of you guys here must have a specific economic sector for you to operate or uh, to work as an assessor. So you cannot assess any program unless you have one, the qualifications to prove that you fall under that economic sector. Number two, experience. If there's no qualification, definitely there must be experience. In other words, you have got some couple of years working in a given industry, that industry that you've been working on for so many years, is the one that we take as a primary a primary uh, sector where we can be able to allocate you and register you as a constituent assessor. So 
without uh, having those, you cannot be an assessor, all right? I just wanna uh, thank uh, this gentleman. Thank you so much. Whatever you've said, you know, now it gives us some uh, understanding because when we are demonstrating on Saturdays, people didn't understand, okay, how do I get a uni standard? It comes from your own economic sector. Whatever you've been doing is where we locate a uni standard that talks to your own industry. Do you get what I'm saying, guys? Are we clear? All right. Yeah, please let us give it up for Mr. George. You've given us uh, something to talk about and an eye opener. I'm going to ask each one of you, please tell us what industry are you in so that we can shoot towards and uh, to, to know which sector do you fall under. Uh, Mem Lydia, which industry are you in? Education. Okay, Mem Lydia, you are under education, definitely. So, Mem Lydia, you fall under quite a number of scopes. So, we believe that under education, you definitely generically fall under ETDP CETA. Okay. Uh, Tuso, you know, you know, your 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 system is written here, Chopster. I don't know whether other people can see it as Chopster, but I see Chopster. But uh, it's your it's your other name. It's fine. What industry are you in, sir? Well, I can't say I'm in any industry at the moment, but I am uh, currently seeking to get uh, into like business. Uh, I'm still waiting for like trainings. I only have uh, a one day training of uh, business management. So I only have uh, a matrix certificate. I was doing a uh, uh, civil engineer and uh, EGD. So I only have uh, my, 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 my matrix certificate so far. Okay. So I wanted to. Okay, so no, no problem. You have got your metric, right? But how yes, many yes. years have you been, you know, working? And in which industry were you working in? Well, I have worked in, uh, in, 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 what is this? I have been a sanitizer for two years uh, in, in, at the school. So that's the only experience that what? I have. A, a, I've been, uh screener i mean <laughs> it's just that people were calling us sanitizer so i forgot and okay uh, you are in I the cleaning that. industry you're in the cleaning industry right yes yes for more than two years okay yes okay with the cleaning experience that you got mr chopster we place you under services sita okay okay that's good uh -huh. We place you under services sitter with the, also your with your knowledge of saying you want to go into business. Business is also under services sitter. Okay. All right. So yes. when we start uh, the interactions on uh, on uh, which sector do you fall under, now you must know you fall under services sitter. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. So you need to write it down. You fall under services sitter. All right. Yes, I And with your CV... With your CV that you must draw up, you must know whatever you're going to draw, you must draw a CV that talks about what you've been doing in the, those years of experience. You must write all the key performance areas, what you've been doing. It gives you points in terms of allocating you to fit into that sector. Now, okay. with this unit standard that you are doing now, assessment and facilitation, they'll give you a you know, some more credits and points into managing trainings within the services industry, more especially into the cleaning and hygiene, uh, you know, field, because you you've say? been doing it. All right, all right. You see? Okay, now we have here Mr. Eric. Mr. Eric, which industry are you in? Good evening, everyone. I'm into the education. Okay. With education, you also fall under 
ETDP CETA. Yes. Please write down this CETA so that you can research more about your very CETA because whatever we're going to do going forward, it will be based onto your own CETA. Okay. You said EGD? ETDP CETA, Education and Training Development Practices Sector Education and Training Authority. So we call it ETDP CETA. I'm going to try to type it here. Now, some people are running out of the system. I don't know if maybe I'm asking so many questions. ETDP CETA. Okay. So, Mr. Chopster, you are under services CETA. We need to write this down. Um, and then, George, you are under TITA. Okay. Please write this one down so that you can know exactly which CETA are you in. Uh, George, you've raised your hand. Please ask your question. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Yusuf. It was for the previous question. My apologies. I didn't drop my hand. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go to Elizabeth. Uh, which industry are you in? Um, I cannot say I'm in any industry but I have higher certificate in law and currently doing my final year in forensic science. In forensic science? Yes. Wow, perfect. You are under service, uh, SACITA, Mama. SACITA. Yeah, forensic is falling under SACITA. So if you are doing uh, forensic science, that is SACITA. So you need to write this one down. But also you have law, isn't it? Yes. Aha, uh -huh. all this is also under SACITA. Okay. Yes. And I also have used short skills certificate in health and science, like SHIREP, HERA. Ah, okay, now. Now, this is another interesting part. Elizabeth, thank you. Now, you know, I just want to give a round of applause to uh, Elizabeth. You know, guys, when you give me what sector you are in, uh, don't only give me, I mean, education, give me your qualification that the way she's doing, that we can also see what other scopes do you have, okay? Because it gives you an understanding of the scopes that you can extend. You know, remember, as an assessor, you're not limited to one sector. You are bound to expand and explore more we call it extension of scope so you can extend your scope to other economic sector you might not be limited to only one sector as education you might have a phd in education however you have other certificates or diplomas in other fields maybe it maybe you know finance and all that so you can extend scope to all those sectors or where you also have some certifications okay so it gives you that understanding. So please, when you say uh, I'm under this sector please or field, don't say I'm in uh, education. I'm in this, this. Give us a breakdown of the qualifications that we can be able to help. Like we have helped Chopster. You know, he gave us a breakdown and we, we saw that there was a challenge, but because of the experience that he has in a specific industry, automatically he found a sector where he falls under. And a lot of people find difficulties. But how can I become an assessor? I don't have this qualification. They forget that even a, a mere certificate can lead you to become a registered, a, regist a registered assessor. Just a certificate that you have acquired some time ago or experience that you've got over a period of time from 12 months upwards, those experiences count. So please do not limit yourself experience count so ma'am uh, you also have some higher eh? you know higher yes. is a good program under hazard identification and risk assessment this is very good program you know so you can also fall under uh mqa because higher is more in, in needed in mqa in hw CETA, you can also work right Health and okay. welfare, you can also work there as a constituent assessor for uh, a, for qualification to do like with a occupational health and safety, you know, both ones. 
those qualifications you do qualify because you've got higher you know okay yes so write this one down health and welfare sitter can be part of your qualification even you can when you can register skills programs under health and welfare sitter you can register for skills to become an assessor for a skills program so you get more points you get more credibility whenever you become an assessor remember assessment is a profession as well you know it takes you to the to another level just that certificate that you get it's like when one is a lawyer like mama isn't it you a law, you you did law so you went and registered right as a so you're a practicing lawyer or you never practiced i've never practiced so you need to register right as a practitioner okay yeah are you doing commercial uh criminal which one are you doing which one did you do um in law i i only did have a certificate in law it, it's more like paralegal paralegal is also mama is a good program you know that right yes. very nice program under sasita you can become a paralegal we have a full qualification called a national certificate paralegal you know that so it's a full qualification yes. there as well also skills programs that you can do uh for legal secretary ne? they are there yes. you can also yes. become an assessor for such a program so it's a it's a bigger scope so you fall under sasita and your role also now is going to take you once you enter sasita you must register with sira okay you know sira no sira is a registration uh, body for those who are into the security and safety industry oh right okay. so you find that yes. when, when you register as an individual there you are ranked high you know you don't need to go and do the gradings or b and c whatever you just register as an individual because of your qualification okay yeah those who register for grading are those, are those one that uh, want to become security guards but you can also become an operational manager in security management companies you can become a coordinator you can become a project manager you know it's quite big just by registration you know okay yes just by registration so your scope is big all right thank you so much so we're gonna talk uh more about that part mr clinton what what skills do you have sir neo please just type in your in call box and i'll just uh, quickly counteract with that one so that we don't need to waste a lot of time on to demonstrating this part but i want to thank you for those contributions please if you want to know Hello? your skill or you want to know your sector where you can practice as an assessor please send in that information onto the in call message then i'll be able to uh demonstrate or explain to you the sector which you can be able to uh practice as an assessor yes sir go ahead good evening sir good evening yeah, to you. i yeah thank you um i i work in aviation sector uh, I think since uh, 2011 till 2022, and uh, I studied uh, French under education. Uh, it's uh, French under education, but I practice uh, in aviation sector as an aviation equipment uh, operator for the earth moving uh, equipment those equipment you use on the aircraft and stuff and uh, and we have a lot of equipment you know that uh, like 14 there about equipment we use uh, on the on so the you are you also working with the ground crew controllers of course yes you know it's hand in hand you know it's uh, we, okay. we work hand in hand with the engineers hand and everything okay. yes so the ground crew the handlers and all that so yeah, the handlers. i please, am actually a handler i am actually a handler yeah just link up with george george you see now we have got your teammate you see i you see george is an george is an air traffic controller 
So mm. their department is, you know, actually, you know, it's an aviation sector. It's a wide, uh, it's a wide uh, this uh, stuff, you know. And uh, you see, he, he, I think he deals directly with, uh, George deals directly uh, with the cockpit, you know, with the pilot directly, you know, during landing and taking off and stuff. But why the aircraft is on ground, you know, it is the duty of the uh, ground, yeah, but ground you crew. You are under the same mm -hmm. industry. So you are under yes, the same yes, industry, yes. aviation. Definitely. Uh, whether yes. the other one is into the traffic control, you are into the ground handlers, you exactly. are all under the same aviation industry. You fall under exactly. the same sector, both of you. Yes, so yes, link sir. up, be a friend to George, and then you'll be able to yeah register yourself, go forward. Uh, Thank you okay, so yeah, you must be able to, you must be able to link up, get in touch with him, George. You've got a partner yes, here in terms of assessment. You guys are gonna assess one another, yeah. So, you've okay, got, you've got okay. a partner here, Mr. Clinton, is also in aviation. You'll be able to link up and then be friends on to the platform, and then, yeah, okay, you'll be able to do assessments together. You know, it's the simplest way. Then, I've got Mr. Eric here who's into education okay. and Mem Lydia into education, so you can become two assessors linking up together to complete your portfolio of evidence. You see Thank you. how quick it Thank is. So much. Nice one. <laughs> it's easy, 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 easy stuff. Uh, we've got also here, uh, Neo, 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 what industry are you in? Um, I wrote in the comment, I said that I am in counseling and psychology because I did my degree and I'm waiting for my honors. But I've also been an interest in education because I have applied for my PGCE to do next year. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, Neo, um, um, Mr. Eric, um, I'm Lydia, you see, you are guys under the same industry, but Neo also you are falling under health and welfare sector because you have got counseling and psychology. So uh, you can also be a partner to uh, Sister Elizabeth. You guys, okay. you can be partners together, right? Because you have the same similar sitters as well. So your extensions of scope can be broader enough, can be big, big, big. Great stuff. Oh. So other members, I don't see other members, uh, however, Maybe they have left. So, however, guys, please get together, get together and then link up yourself to see what programs can you be able to assess in those sectors. Now, the point is what programs can you assess? All of you, this is, let it be your one of one assignment. Let us start with this. Let us link up uh, to understand what can I assess in my industry? If you are in education, what can you assess? If you are into uh, transport, what you what can you assess? In uh, services, what you what can you assess? So you're going to identify the programs that you can be able to assess. And I'm going to give you a task right now. Uh, we are going to go on to uh, SACWA. So you're going to type in www.saka.org dot za okay. i've put in that link onto the in call message uh please you can tap on it to open up that uh, platform tap on it to open up that platform and then we can be able to proceed so this one allows you to search for a qualification every person like i said every assessor you are here you are going to be able to conduct assessment in your own field so you must be a subject matter expert or someone with experience in that field i have seen here uh chopster you've got more experience you can see now you've got experience in photography for more than three years you've got experience in farming in farming uh so you've got you've got a lot sir so you fall under quite a number because we had placed you under services CETA, but I see we can also add a MICT CETA, that is for computation. MICT CETA is the one responsible for photography, okay? MI, it is written uh, MICT CETA. 
Okay. Also, you fall under a Greek seeker. A Greek yes, seeker. Uh, those those seeders I have been following, but I didn't have quite enough information about the now you're MIC. Going to know. Now MIC. you're going to know. Now you're going yes, to know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now you're going to know. So you now you have you you fall under also my city sitter because of your photography, and then you also fall under a Greek sitter because of your farming experience. So you can actually extend your scope, sir. You know, big time, big time. You can extend your scope just by doing these three modules, these three unit standards: facilitator, assessor, moderator. You can expand your scope and be a constituent assessor in a Greek, be a, an assessor in a MICT CETA, right? Because of those experience. So people take normally these things for granted, but they can add value in terms of the career support and career development. You can grow yourself individually and professionally as well, because a professional assessor does not come cheap, you know, a company can hire someone to be an assessor and then they will be paying you pelena that you assess you can imagine pelena and we don't work uh full time you know in those organizations you work part time because you might have been contracted by a couple of, a number of other organization as an assessor you know so you find yourself at the end of the month you can invoice five to seven companies or 10 companies that you've conducted assessment. I, you, you get what I'm saying? So you earn, and this one is, 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 is not limited to one industry, but it's brought to many other industries that you've got other certificates that you can prove that you can assess, right? You can be in education, but you've got so much skills in counseling, you know? And then you extend your scope to HW as a counselor. So you can be there as uh, a, 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 an instructor in aviation, but you may find yourself that you also know uh, uh, programs in professional development, like uh, in facilitation or like in uh, machine operating, you know, the other unit standards that are for machine operating operating or cleaning and hygiene or whatever so it is the scope is is is, is unlimited it's, it's so broad you know and we are going to learn all these things we got we're gonna learn all these things so uh in the next and the next 15 minutes also we are going to go through uh please i i sent you as a link for sakwa please go and navigate in your free time, navigate this link to know which sector do you fall under. When you go to the to SACWA, SACWA will give you a list of sitters. Click on those sitters, you'll see the information about those sitters, okay? Because remember, SACWA is the one that registers or accredits all sitters. So go and navigate more information about your sitter where you fall under. And then you'll see information that you never expected, you know, that is readily available for you to use okay now i'm gonna quickly go into uh to dive into one or two uh components here all right i'm gonna dive into one or two so that we can get a full understanding of of uh our nqf system Now, when we talk about uh, the NQF system, please, you need to know that there are certain things that you need to understand, all right? These are new terminologies, and we use these ones frequently. A, a lecturer is the same as a facilitator. A student is the same as a learner. An examiner is the same as an assessor. A syllabus is the same as a uni standard. So when we come to uni standards, please do not ask me what is a uni standard. I will show you a sample, an example 
of uh, unit standard as we go forward in our next lesson tomorrow. But today you need to know that a syllabus is the same as a unit standard and all unit standards must be registered on SAQA. They must be registered. An exam is the same as assessment. And we have two forms of assessment. Now there's another third one that was introduced by, uh, by the QCTO. I'll also explain that part. As an assessor, you need to know that when you assess, it means you are examining people. You are examining people on assessment, okay? So when you conduct assessment, you are examining people. So whatever you examine them, it's called assessment. And assessment is in two ways, either formative, that is during the learning process, or summative at the end of the learning process. Uh, Ma'am Lydia, you are in education. I think you can explain much more about this, right? Am I correct? Uh, Mr. Eric, am I correct? Correct, correct sir. Thank you. you are right, sir. You are right. You are right. You are right. Thank you, guys. These are our professional you know, education so because I'm dealing with educational people here. An exam in our own uh, OBE and NQF. Remember, the mainstream education doesn't have this assessment, uh, formative, summative, and all that. You've got generic progression assessment, whatever, classroom test, all that kind of stuff. In NQF, we have got either formative or summative. Formative is a form of assessment that we give out during the learning process. This includes activities that you do in class, uh, that you give out in class or in the workplace, uh, small tasks that, you know, a facilitator is part of that, uh, uh, those activities, uh, group exercises and stuff. Those are called formative. They are given out during the learning process. Whereas the summative is like your test. You know, it's given out at the end of the, the learning process. In other words, you can give a progress a, a, a progress test, maybe uh, an a end of term test or stuff. Those are called a summative because it's, it summarizes what has been covered in a given time frame. You know, it summarizes what has been given or studied in a, and then it's put together as an integrated assessment and then it's given out for you to answer. So sometimes it is scored against uh, 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 time or it's done either in, in, in a closed classroom or it's done in an open field as a practical assessment task, all right? So it depends on which type of assessment is it gonna be. Sometimes it is practical, sometimes it's theoretical. So if it is theoretical, it will be a closed assessment with questions which are closed-ended, you know, closed-ended questions are the one that they ask you, define the following terms, list down, blah, 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 explain, demonstrate. Those are questions that have been uh, asked, you know, in the in, in, in the summative way, in the, in, the, in, in, in the final examination. But there are those that are also open-ended questions which uh, lead to research, you know, uh, an open-ended question does not have an ending. It's the limit is the sky is the limit. You can research, but you've got, of course, the range where you can end, you know, but they give you literally an open check for you to go and, and research, you know, go conduct a survey, go and do a project, you know, and then present that uh, information either in form of a report or in form of a demonstration, whatever that the, the research is all about. So we shall also demonstrate or discuss those kind of assessments, either formative or summative. How do you evaluate a formative assessment? How do you evaluate a summative assessment? Uh, under which circumstances are you able to assess someone formatively? In class, you're talking about a topic and then you pause all of a sudden and ask individual people or you put up a group assessment question and then you put them together into a group and then they discuss that group uh, into the group and then one person will come out to present. In other words, that person represents the entire group, their answer that they are supposed to be uh, awarded the same similar marks anyway. So that is under P1. 
peer assessment. We shall discuss those peer assessment where one person is literally assessing, is, is, is presenting an assessment for a group of individuals. Uh, formative assessment is very interesting because it involves learning. It is part of the learning process. Well, as summative is where uh, people are able to sit individually and they answer questions based on to their own understanding. Okay, that is summative. Also, the terminologies will lead to the end courses or the netted program. They are phasing out now under Umalusi. We have three quality councils. The first quality council is called the Council on Higher Education. That's where we have all our higher certificates, the degrees, the diplomas, the PhDs, and all that. They are all under Higher Education Council, the Council on Higher Education. And then we have Umalusi that is responsible for all this netted qualification, the vocational qualifications, as well as the normal school, your grade 12 certificate is under Umalusi. Uh, and then the last council is called the Quality Council for Trades and Occupation. This comprises of workforce, individuals in the workforce that all economic sectors are drawn into, the CETAs are drawn into that council because it deals with occupation, it deals with work, all right? At the same time, also we have those that are out of work, but they literally adult individuals that uh, never got the opportunity to go into the mainstream schools. We, we put them under what is called IET, you know, uh, or ABET. All right, we shall also demonstrate those uh, kind of schools to see under the NQF system. Then uh, RPL, one can do the work, but do not have any qualification to prove it. All right, so those are the terminologies we're going to find uh, going forward into demonstrating the, uh, the assessment uh, principles. Okay. So please, when you meet or you come across these uh, terms, please do not be confused because they normally have uh, similar, you know, uh, explanations. Like uh, one will be asking, what is a uni standard? Please, you need to know it's just as simple as a syllabus, right? That we call a uni standard nowadays in the new NQF system. But of course, in the main educational system, syllabus is syllabus, right? The legacy qualification, they're still following the syllabus, the topics, the chapters. The QCTO has just introduced it as well through the new uh, qualification framework for the QCTO, where I've got the knowledge component, the practical, and then the workplace-based components, but they've got topics and subtopics, right? Okay, so do we have any question to ask before we can be able to proceed? Let me get those questions. If you have any questions, please do ask. However, uh, we have run out of time. And uh, when we meet again tomorrow, we're going to be going deeper to explain the NQF system. Let me quickly present to you that system, all right? Let me present to you that system. The system is comprising of two main departments, the Department of Education and the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor is responsible for national skills strategy and the national skills development. And then the Department of Education is comprising of SACWA, the South African Qualification Authority. Please make sure you go and read more about these, uh, these stakeholders, more especially SACWA, the South African Qualification Authority. Please, because that's where you're going to be practicing more as an assessor, all right? Remember, SACWA is responsible for all uh, registration of qualifications. A qualification can only be registered when uh, SOPs have been developed or the standard operating procedures. And these are developed under NSB, the National Standard Bodies. There's a set of bodies that has been designated, registered, appointed, by the minister to design standard operating procedure for every special program, for all every specialized uh, qualification. If you are a nurse, 
there are specific SOPs that a nurse must follow. If you are a plumber, there are specific standards that a plumber must follow. If you are a doctor or whatever, or every profession, they have got specific uh, standards that or procedures that one needs to follow. These procedures are developed by the NSB. And then once the procedures have been developed, a qualification curriculum now can be developed by what is called SGB, the Standard Operating Bodies. These develop the curriculum that you see uh, available right now on this uh, on the NQF system. Every curriculum that you see has gone through what is called SGB or the Standard Generating Bodies. They sit down, say, a panel of professionals and uh, subject matter experts who analyze the industry. And remember, SGB is not one, and it's not school governing board. Ne? Mr. Eric, SGB is not a school governing board. It's the standard uh, <laughs> generating board. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because we might confuse the two. We might think that SGB <laughs> are talking about the school governing board. Ne? No. <laughs> uh uh the, the 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 school governing board is something else ne? yes yes yeah, yes something else here we are we are referring to the standard generating body this is a set of individuals a panel of subject matter experts that have been appointed to research and gather evidence uh in relation to the industry right and then they identify a skill shortage and then they write a curriculum to mitigate those uh, shortages you get what i'm saying so this is what is called the sgbs and once a curriculum has been developed it will be sent to the nsa the national skills authority for funding because remember at the end of the day the department of labor is there to support and grow industries or sectors the Department of Labor is dividing all the labor force into their own relative economic sectors, all right? So without those economic sectors, we cannot have the Department of Labor operating fully to its capacity, but it can only do so to support every economic sector because why is it supposed to support and forcing in to fund individuals to go into those sectors and perform why because the country is dependent on the department of labor the economic growth the gdp of the country can only be determined when all its economic sectors are producing positively Without positive results from every economic sector, there will be decline in growth of the country. You get what I'm saying? So we need laborers, we need a skilled labor force who will be able to go and work into those vacancies, those positions, and then work. When they work, they are taxed. And when they are taxed, the money that goes, that is collected, goes to SARS as revenue. And those industries also pay, they are they pay their taxes. That tax money, that money that has been collected is used to grow the country in terms of development, hospitals, education, and all other aspects of uh, uh, support that the government needs to give to its people in terms of service delivery, right? It's because of the Department of Labor. You get what I'm saying? So once the labor is being fulfilled with its a mandate, then the National Skills Authority will come into play to fund every program that has been put out. That's why if there is a scarcity of workers, the leadership will be produced and then it will be advertised and an invite will be requested for individuals to express their interest in studying against a specific learning program or leadership. You get what I'm saying? So the CETAs then come into play to regulate all training that is given into their own specification, into their own due spaces, due restrictions. So every sector has got its own CETA. That, that's one thing that you need to know as an assessor. And I'm going to show you where do you feature as an assessor. Remember, SGB has produced a program. So it's your role as an, as an assessor to understand 
where do you fall under which economic sector do you fall under so that you can contribute towards the economic growth as a whole your sitter will show you exactly what programs are available and available for you to support in terms of assessment so sitters will come into play to roll out the learnerships that are available and those learnerships can only be implemented or programs can only be implemented with qualified assessors so training providers training providers can only conduct assessment if there are qualified assessors and assessors will assess programs in line with the etqas or the quality uh, assurers of the sitters and then assessment can only be conducted in the nkf levels either from level five to ten from level four to two from level two to one these are the sectors where or the bands where you can conduct assessment either you're going to fall under higher education like we can see individuals who are working for universities and and higher institutions you you can take up programs from nkf level five to ten if you are under fet you can take a program from NKF level two to four. If you are under the GETC level, that is the general education, and then the schools, normal schools, and the ABET, then that is level one. The here is managed by the QCTO. So this, in a nutshell, is what we call the NKF system. And it is driven specifically to support education and training development within uh, a given community or province or country. Your role as an assessor is to form part of the assessment part and provide quality education and training under the education and training quality assurers. You as an assessor feature here. That's why you cannot conduct assessment unless you've been registered as a constituent assessor yourself. Any question? Okay, as there's no question guys, thank you so much. We're gonna stop our, our training tonight here and then we shall proceed tomorrow to understand the components of the NQF. I thank you and have a good evening. God bless you and goodbye. Thank you, likewise. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Sir. Yeah. It was a nice session. Thank, thank you. you. Speak tomorrow evening. Yeah, no. We just finished, but then I don't know how to speak tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you.